Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank and praise you, O God, for this day, for this time, for this opportunity that you've given us to study your word, Lord. We pray that you'll bless this time and that you'll bless our efforts, that you'll lead our thoughts, meditations, and that what we think and what we speak will be pleasing to you. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to study your word in a fruitful manner. And we pray that wherever you want us to change, that you would impress upon our hearts the areas, the ways in which we need to change according to your will, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How to be joyful in all circumstances. That is this topic that we are studying because that is the topic that comes up in the book of Philippians in Philippians chapter 1 verse 12 to 26. Paul is writing from prison but he has more joy than people who are outside prison. And uh, we've been saying repeatedly that there are certain reasons for Paul's joy. It's not just that he's automatically joyful. There are some uh, definite reasons and those reasons are very clearly revealed in this passage, Philippians 1, verse 12 to 26. And I've also repeatedly said that these reasons have to do with the heart and the mind. Paul's heart seems to be different in the sense that he desires different things. And Paul's mind seems to be different in the sense that he thinks in a different way. So his thinking is different. His feeling is different. His passions are different. His knowledge is different. His loving is different. What he loves is different. What he knows is different. And that's what enables him to be joyful. And I believe that we too can be joyful in all circumstances if we would change our heart and mind, if we would change the way we think and change what we desire. Or let me put it like this, Christian life is about growing in love and knowledge. Christian life is about growing, making progress in, in what we love, in what we want, in what we desire, and also in what we know to be true, right? Growing in love and knowledge, we saw in Philippians 1 verse 9 to 11. That's what Christian growth is about. We grow in love and knowledge. We grow we become mature and different about the things we want in life. And we become mature about what we know. When that kind of change happens, I think that's the way to be like Paul. Not to suffer like Paul, because even if you wanted to suffer, I don't think most people will ever suffer like Paul. But, when you are faced with difficult circumstances, if you can have a different kind of heart desiring different kind of things and a different kind of mind thinking entirely different from the world, then you can be joyful in all circumstances. So already from our study of verse 12 to 19, we have seen uh, four reasons. I've given four reasons from the text for Paul's joy. So let me just list them out and then we will look at what we're looking at today. So the first reason is revealed in the underpinning of verse 12 and that is Paul has a great passion that the gospel must make progress no matter what. Paul's great desire, passion, is that the gospel must keep progressing. And so as long as the gospel is progressing, even though he is suffering, he is able to have joy. Reason number two, we saw from verse 12, is that Paul has a special knowledge that God can even use the evil things that happen to us for the good of the gospel. Paul knows what others don't know. What is that? That God can use even the bad things that happen to us for the good of the gospel, to make the gospel 
progress. God is that kind of God. He works in that kind of way. And Paul knows this. He's aware of this. He's seen it happen. And when he sees it happen, when he sees that the gospel has made progress just because he was put in chains, <laughs> in and through his chains itself, the gospel made progress. He rejoices. That was reason number two. Reason number three is Paul has a great passion that Christ must be exalted in the act of preaching. Paul has a great passion that Christ must be exalted in the act of preaching. What is the great goal of preaching? You ask Paul, he will tell you that the goal of preaching is to exalt Jesus Christ. That's the goal of Christian preaching. It's not just to give some words of advice and wisdom, but to exalt ultimately Jesus Christ. And when Paul learns that Christ is being exalted through others preaching, because he's not able to preach out in the open, when he learns that Christ is being exalted through the preaching of others, he is able to rejoice even though those other preachers are actually enemies of Paul or, or working against Paul or trying to add to his suffering by preaching. Now, if you didn't hear some of this, the older messages are on YouTube where you'll find more detailed explanation. So this reason number three is from verse 15 to verse 18. Paul's great passion that Christ be exalted in preaching. Reason number four is found in verse 19. And that is, again, knowledge. We have this alternating between passion and knowledge, right? Now, in verse 19, the reason given is that Paul knows, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance or salvation. Paul knows this is revealed knowledge, special knowledge. This is knowledge that not everybody has, but he knows that everything will turn out for his own personal good. Everything will turn out for his own personal good. Verse 19, he says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. And by this, he means especially the bad things. Everybody knows how the good things will turn out good. But not everybody knows even the bad things will turn out for good. And this time, he means to say his own good. My salvation is the term he uses. My, it'll turn out for my deliverance, my salvation, my victory, my good. All the bad stuff that happens to me, he says, will turn out for my good. And this is what we've been looking at for the last two weeks. Now, today, we move on to verse 20. Even though I have not covered one thing in verse 19, and that is the last part of verse 19, Paul talks about how this will turn out for our good. He says, through prayer and the Holy Spirit's help. I have not said much about the help of the Holy Spirit, but keep that aside and let's move to verse 20. But by looking at verse 20, I hope to go back and make some comments on the help of the Holy Spirit, which Paul talks about in verse 19. So let's look at verse 20, where we see yet another reason behind Paul's joy. And in the course of uh, studying verse 20, I hope to say some things about the help of the Holy Spirit that Apostle Paul mentions in verse 19. So let's look at verse 20. Let's read verse 19 and verse 20. Philippians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Now you notice I read verse 19 and verse 20 because they are connected. Verse 20 begins with the words according to. Right? So that connects it with verse 19. So I want to say a word about how they're connected before we look at the details of verse 20. Always you've got to notice these connections in the Bible, otherwise you'll miss it. You'll misunderstand whatever verse you're looking at if you fail to see how it's connected with what comes before and what comes after. So verse 19 and verse 20 are connected. And there's a lot of details, but you've got to be able to see past the details or get a bird's eye view at the main 
kind of sentences in verse 19 and 20. So let me give you the main sentences in verse 19 and 20. For I know that this will turn out for my salvation. And then the true is telling you how this will turn out for his salvation. He knows it will turn out for his salvation through prayer and the Holy Spirit. And then verse 20 comes in right there, according to, so if you can imagine it like this, here's the main sentence, for I know that this will turn out for my salvation. How will it turn, it, turn out for my salvation? Through the prayer and the Holy Spirit. And according to what will it turn out for my salvation? According to my earnest expectation and hope. So if you were to outline verse 19 and 20, that's how you would do it. The main sentence is, for I know that this will turn out my salvation. And then through the Holy Spirit and prayer is indented. And then the, below the through is according to. According to my earnest expectation. So that's the main way he structures verse 19 and 20. Paul is a very careful writer. He's a brilliant man. He's, you know, very well studied, well educated and all that. And so he writes in a very clear and very organized manner. He's saying, I know it'll turn out for my salvation. How will this happen? It'll happen through two ways. One is believers praying for me and the Holy Spirit supplying help. According to what will this happen? According to my earnest expectation and hope. So that's the connection between verse 19 and 20. Verse 20 tells us, gives us more detail, shall we say, how this will end up turning out to his salvation. Verse 20 tells us, in accordance with what this will turn out for his salvation. In accordance with what? That's like saying, you know, you have to win the race in the Olympics according to the rules. There, right? They have certain rules. You got to win the race according to the rules. Paul is saying, I know this will work out for my ultimate good according to my earnest expectation and hope. So with that connection in mind, let's look at verse 20. So the key words in verse 20 are my earnest expectation and hope. Everything else is about that. What is his earnest expectation and hope? The rest of the verse. That in nothing I will be ashamed, but with all boldness. So there's a lot of words. We'll come to that. But the key words there are according to my earnest expectation and hope. That is the fifth reason, actually, for Paul's joy. His earnest expectation and hope. He has a certain earnest expectation and hope. And because of that, he believes things will turn out for his salvation. And knowing that, he rejoices. So what is his earnest expectation and hope? We need to understand those two words, earnest expectation and hope. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Let's look at those two terms. Earnest expectation is a translation of one Greek word. That word earnest in English is an old word. King James language, earnest, earnest. Right? What does that mean? It simply means eager. The newer translations say eager expectation. Eager, eager means you really want to have something. You desire something very much. That's what eager means, right? So when Paul says, this is my eager expectation, what he's saying is, this is my great passion. This is my deep desire, one translation says. Or some commentators put it like this, passionate longing. This is my passionate Longing, the same word is used in Romans 8, 19 to talk about how creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation is waiting eagerly for the day when God will remake everything, create a new heavens and the new earth and so on. So what this word conveys, earnest expectation, it conveys that desire, that passion. That longing, again, we have this passion, his, his desire, the desire of his heart, right? What does the word hope convey? Hope, I've already said that hope has a very strong meaning in the New Testament, not a weak meaning. Today, you know, you may hope that I finish on time, but that is not a very 
strong hope, I would say. But when the New Testament says hope, it talks about being certain about what will happen in the future. Christian hope is being certain about what will happen in the future. You're absolutely sure that this will happen in the future. That's what hope in the New Testament is about. Hope is always a certain hope, certainty. So you have these two terms Paul takes, right? Eager expectation, which conveys his desire and his, his passion, his longing. And then you have this hope word, which conveys certainty. Certainty. He's sure that it'll happen. So you combine the two words, eager expectation and hope. The first word and the second word. You put it together. What do you get? You get desire and hope. Desire and hope. Paul has a certain desire and hope. Or let me put it like this. Paul wants something to happen and Paul is sure that that something will happen. His desire and hope are the same thing. According to my earnest expectation and hope that, so he desires one thing and the same thing he hopes for. He wants something to happen and he's sure that this something will happen. Paul's desire and hope. That is the reason for his joy. Now, before we look at what his desire and hope is, pause with me and think about this combination of these two aspects of humanity, right? This is something only humans have into this level, desire, hope. We desire great things. We hope for great things, right? And isn't it interesting that for Paul, he desires and hopes for the same thing. There's so much packed in this verse that uh, it's easy to miss this, right? Paul desires for and hopes for one thing. Why is that important? Because if you think about it, why are people not joyful? What takes away somebody's joy? Because they are desiring one thing, but they are not sure it will happen. <laughs> right? They want something. Generally, people, why they lose their joy is they want something, right? But circumstances tell them it may not happen. It may never happen. They're sure something will happen, but it's not what they want. Their hope and their desire don't meet. What they desire is not what they are certain about. I'll give you a simple illustration, right? Let's take a child, a small child. Let's say that today the child is forced to study all day. Basically, the child is suffering. <laughs> it's not having a good day. But the child wants to go to the toy shop tomorrow. Today, it's in the midst of suffering. Tomorrow, it wants to go to the toy shop. Now, if you tell that child, no, I don't think we can go tomorrow, what's going to happen? The thing they wanted the most, now it doesn't look like they're going to get it, right? So they lose their joy. They're so disappointed because that's what they look forward to the most. They want it. They desire it. But we dash their hopes and they, we say, you know, we can't go tomorrow. That's it. They lose their joy. They get disappointed. Now consider the alternative. Imagine the same situation. The child is forced to study today all day, right? The child is suffering, shall we say, a little bit, right? And the child wants to go to the toy shop tomorrow. And you tell the child, yes, we will surely go. So the child has a strong desire to go to the toy shop. And you are giving the child hope, certainty. We will surely go. So when the two meet when the two are there, desire and hope, and what you desire the most is what you're certain about, the child is joyful today itself, even though it is suffering today. <laughs> In the middle of its studying today, it will be thinking about tomorrow. Right? Even though it hates the studying, it's looking forward to the toy shop outing tomorrow. Right? Because it knows we're surely going to go. When you're sure you're going to get what you want, you can be joyful even in the midst of suffering. 
if you're sure you're going to get what you want, you can be joyful even in the midst of suffering. When your desire and your hope meet in one thing, when you desire one thing and that's the same thing you're certain will happen, you don't have to ever lose your joy. But the problem is, like children, our desires are too small, <laughs> too immature. If we can somehow replace small desires with greater desires, if we can replace immature desires with mature desires, if we can somehow have a desire that will come to fulfillment no matter what, then we will never lose our joy. If you can desire what will surely happen, no matter what, like the psalmist says in Psalm 46, right? Though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, <laughs> I will not fear. Why? There's one thing that cannot be moved. God is our refuge and strength. It's like that. If you have a desire that is unshakable, <laughs> that is indestructible, no matter what happens, this desire will be fulfilled. So you can be sure that the desire will come to fulfillment. Your desire and your hope are one. Then you can have joy in all kinds of circumstances. So the question is, do we have the right desires? Do we have the desires, the right desires? We all have all kinds of desires. Do we have the right desires? Or more precisely, the question is, do we have the right order to our desires? Do we order our desires in the right way? Do we prioritize our desires in the right way? So we can have many kinds of desires in this life, but what do we prioritize the most? What do we desire the most? Becomes the important question. So anyway, let's get back to the text here. So Paul is saying, this will turn out to my salvation according to my desire and hope. I have a certain desire and a hope. And because of that, I know it's going to turn out to my good. So what is his desire and hope? He gives the answer in verse 20 and he gives a twofold answer, shall we say. He first states it in a negative way and then he states it in a positive way. Okay, so look at verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and hope that... You know, he's going to tell you what his desire and hope is. In nothing I shall be ashamed. That's the negative. But with all boldness as always, uh, that's the positive. You know, now look at the negative first. In nothing I shall be ashamed. Paul's desire and hope stated negatively is that he will not be ashamed in anything or in any way he will not be ashamed. It is both his desire and his hope. He doesn't want to be ashamed in anything in any way and he knows he will not be ashamed in anything or any way. Now, if you just look at the negative statement, it appears as though, you know, if, if an average Christian or even an average human being were to read verse 20 and stop with the negative statement alone, you may think maybe Paul is talking about you know, I know I'm not going to be ashamed. What does he mean by that? Maybe he means, I know I'm not going to remain in prison. Or maybe he means, I know I will not die like this. Right? And in that sense, he's saying, I know I'll be set free from prison. I know I will live and not die. And in that sense, I will not be ashamed. That's a perfectly legitimate way to understand it if he had stopped there just with the negative statement. But he doesn't stop with the negative statement. He then clarifies it with a positive statement. He says, here's my desire and hope. It is that in nothing I'll be ashamed, but here's the positive statement. With all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Now once you read that, you know he's not saying he does not mean I will not be ashamed in the sense that I will not die. Because he just said, 
I will not be ashamed, but what? Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. What he's saying is, whether I live or die, I won't be ashamed. That's my hope. So Paul's idea of in nothing will I be ashamed is different from the average Christian's idea of in nothing will I be ashamed. Or even different from the psalmist's idea in many times, many places. See, salvation, not being ashamed, these, these kind of terms can be taken in different ways depending on the context. So in some places, if you look at what salvation means, what not being ashamed means, it simply means getting delivered from those enemies, getting that uh, short-term victory, that temporal victory, that problem you're going through now, getting victory in that. But you've got to look at the context and understand what it means. In this context, it does not refer to short-term victory. It does not refer to just Paul coming out of prison, Paul living, because he himself says, whether by life or by death, which means he has an idea of not being ashamed that is valid even in death. <laughs> okay? So, what is Paul's idea of uh, not being ashamed? He has a different idea. What is his idea of not being ashamed? He says it. His idea of not being ashamed is Christ will be magnified in his body. Doesn't matter whether it's by life or by death. The point is Christ will be magnified in his body. As long as Christ is magnified in his body, it doesn't matter whether it's by life or by death, he will not be ashamed. That's his understanding of not being ashamed here. It's so important we understand this. For Paul, in this place, being ashamed or not being ashamed is not about whether he's released or not. Or it's not about whether he lives or not. It's whether or not Christ is magnified in his body. Christ is magnified in his body. Now, what does that mean? Body. Christ is magnified in his body. When he says body here, you can take it in the meaning of Christ is magnified in me. Just like that, you can take it. It's not just a body meaning flesh and bone. That's not what he means. Why he says my hope, my desire is that Christ will be magnified in my body is, he can't say Christ will be magnified in my life. Because if he says that, that will cause confusion because he's next going to say whether by life or death. So he can't use the word life. So he can't say, he can't, usually we'll say, I want God to be glorified in my life, right? I want Jesus to be glorified in my life. That's the usual way we talk. But he can't use that word life here because he's going to say whether by life or death and then the next verse 21 is going to say to live is Christ and to die is gain. So he can't confuse us by using the word life. So he has to use some other word. That's why he uses the word Body not to restrict the magnification of Christ to mere flesh and blood or something like that. He means our earthly existence. He says, my desire and my hope is that Christ will be magnified in my earthly existence. In earth only we exist in a body. So that's what he's trying to say, right? For example, in the New Testament, it says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Only my body, not my spirit and my soul? No, that's not what it means. Because in another verse it says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. One place it says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Another place it says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So your body means you, in your earthly existence, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want to go more into that term body, but I think we should just take it, not in a very strict way, body, but rather in me. Paul's great desire and hope is that Christ will be magnified in his earthly existence. Whether that means he will continue to exist or whether it means he will cease to exist, whether by life or by death. So what is the answer he's giving here? Let's stop and think about this answer. What is Paul's greatest desire? It's not to be free from prison. It's not even just to live and not die. Paul's greatest desire is Christ should be magnified in me. The issue of whether he lives or dies becomes secondary to him. Right? This is Paul's greatest desire. And because he has this desire, because he has this desire, what desire? That Christ should be magnified in his body whether he lives or dies. Because he has this lofty desire, 
Even if he were not released, he won't lose his joy. <laughs> even if he were to be put to death, even if they killed him, they can't take away his joy. As long as Christ is magnified in his body, whether by life or by death, Paul can be joyful because his desire is like that. Not only his desire, but also his hope, his certainty, his surety. What is his greatest certainty at this point? What is his greatest surety? What is he most certain about? That he'll be released from prison? That he will live and not die? He, he is certain to an extent about that. He reveals in verse 25 and 26. He is certain to an extent that he's going to be freed. But what is his greatest certainty? It is his greatest certainty is that Christ will be magnified in his body whether he lives or dies. <laughs> you ask him, Paul, are you, are you sure uh, you know, whether he'll come out of prison or not? He'll say, that doesn't matter so much to me. Put that second. <laughs> Number one is, I'm sure that Christ will be magnified in my body whether I live or die. He's absolutely sure that Christ will be magnified in his body. Good question to ask is, how is he sure? <laughs> but we're not going to get into that right now. For now, just notice that his desire and hope are one. And what is that one desire and hope that he has above all else that Christ will be magnified in his body, whether by life or by death? Because his desire and hope are so lofty and they've come together in this lofty thing that Christ be magnified because there's no conflict between his desire and his hope. He can be joyful in all circumstances. He can be joyful in all circumstances because he desires for and hopes for the greatest thing, the most indestructible thing, the thing which will surely be fulfilled, which is Christ will be magnified in his body. The thought of dying cannot take away his joy. Why? What he would say is, as long as in my death I magnify Christ, that's enough for me. <laughs> the thought of suffering more cannot take away his joy because what he would say is, as long as in my suffering I exalt Christ, I'm happy. See, his heart wants something else and his heart is sure about something else. And it's the same thing. It's the glorification of Christ in his body. Previously, we saw it was the glorification of Christ in preaching. In preaching, Christ must be exalted. Now Paul is saying, in my body, Christ must be magnified. The word magnified is actually the word enlarged. Enlarged must be shown as large, big. Think about that answer, right? It's a bit of a, you may even say it's a crazy philosophy. Crazy way to think, an extreme way to think. As far as Paul is concerned, even if he were to die, that doesn't mean he will be ashamed. Even if they killed him, that doesn't mean he will be ashamed because in his mind, if Christ is magnified in his dying, then he's not ashamed. Now, now think about that for a minute. How could Christ possibly be magnified in his death? He's in prison, so he probably has some hearing or questioning, interrogation or something like that coming up. We don't know for sure, but it's possible. They say that might be the background of these verses. If in his hearing trial, things don't go well, maybe he may be executed. If he dies, how could Christ possibly be magnified by death, by Paul's death? Let me try to explain that. Imagine in the interrogation or in the hearing, in the trial, they tell Paul, you know, if you want to stay alive, deny this Jesus Christ whom you preach. Paul would say, no, I can't do that. I'd rather die than deny this Jesus. Now what they would do is, what they might do is cut off his head which church tradition tells us is what actually happened, not regarding the book of Philippians, but regarding the actual end of Paul's life, they say probably he had his head cut off. He was probably beheaded. 
as a martyr for Christ. So what I just told you is not a hypothetical situation. It probably happened to him. They probably said you can stay alive. We'll let you live if you deny Christ. And he would have said, no, I can't do it. I'd rather die than deny Christ. Now what happens there is Christ would be magnified in such a death. How? When a man is on the verge of losing his very life and yet he is able to say, Jesus Christ is more valuable to me than my life itself. When a man is about to lose his very life and yet he is able to say, I value Jesus more than my life itself. And even if I gave up my life for him, he's still worth it. At that moment, guess who looks so great and valuable and glorious? It's Jesus. At that moment, that, that shocks people. They think, are you crazy? Are you willing to lose your life for this man you claim lived and died and rose again? He means so much to you. And a person like Paul would say, yes. He means everything to me. To live is Christ. Living is all about Christ for me. I'd rather die than not live for him. In death, it is possible to magnify Christ. For Paul, I just described a situation that would be true of any martyr. Anybody who dies for their faith in Jesus. What about living? How would he magnify Christ in life? See, again, here also you have to understand it carefully. The average person may think that just being released from prison means Paul is not ashamed or that glorifies Christ. The average person may think that simply staying alive and not dying means I'm not ashamed. Paul is not ashamed and that glorifies Christ. But no, it doesn't work like that. You know, just because Paul is released from prison or just because Paul is allowed to live doesn't mean Christ is magnified in that kind of situation. Now, for example, in the trial, in the hearing, if they told Paul, you know, if you deny your faith in Christ, we'll let you live, we'll release you. And he suppose... This didn't happen, but I'm just hypothetically saying now. Suppose he denied his faith in Christ. And suppose he's released as a result of that. And suppose he lives as a result of that. Suppose he gets free from his temporal sufferings as a result of that. Human beings out in the world may call that not being ashamed. They may call that a success. As far as Paul is concerned, there is no greater failure than that. That is being ashamed. If he denied his faith in Christ and was released as a result of that, and if he lived as a result of that, that would be the greatest failure. That would be the greatest shame. It's a different way of thinking, you see. See, even in today's world, even in the New Testament world, society is big on shame and honor, right? Even today, even in a country like India, they would say, it's better to die than to live with shame. In some cases, they would say that. Right? Because they value honor so highly. And they look down on shame so badly. Right? So that, that kind of world is the New Testament world only more than that. <laughs> they valued honor greater. They look down on shame even worse. So, in that society, just like us, just like the average person today, they would think also, being released from prison, being staying alive and, you know, getting these earthly blessings, that is success, that is uh, uh, honor and so on. In the midst of that, Paul, not only Paul, other Christians as well, are willing to give up anything for the sake of Christ. Why? Because they were looking to their final salvation. They were looking beyond this. You know, if they were to deny Christ now, what would happen? <laughs> In the end, they would, you know, Jesus says, important verses to be read in connection with this passage, I think. In Mark chapter 8, verse 38, Jesus says, whoever is ashamed of me 
and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man, also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father and with the holy angels. He says, if somebody is ashamed of me in this world, I'll also be ashamed of him. That means I will not acknowledge him on that great final day. 1 John chapter 2 also a very important verse to read in connection with this. 1 John chapter 2. And now little children abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. See, for the New Testament believers, the greatest shame that a person could have is not shame in the eyes of this world, is shame in the eyes of Jesus himself. The thing they feared the most or the thing they didn't want the most, they did not want to stand ashamed when Jesus came at his second coming. They wanted to face him boldly. John says, abide in him. Don't wander away. Don't be doing nonsense. You know, abide in him. That when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Because all the shame in this world will one day be redeemed. When God gives us our final salvation, he will clothe us with so much glory that every bit of shame will be forgotten. But if you gain all the honor in this world possible, and yet... If we stand before Christ at his second coming with shame, there is no point. All the honor that we can gain in this world becomes meaningless at that point. So Paul has all this in mind. He's saying, my great desire and hope is that in nothing I shall be ashamed. In no way I'll be ashamed. But with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Now, positively, what does it mean to magnify Christ in his life? He tells in verse 22. Positively, what does it mean to magnify Christ in his life, in living, by living? He says, if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. He says, if I live, I will live for Christ. In verse 21, he says, to live is Christ. If I live, I will live for Christ. And if I live for Christ, I will labor for Christ. And that labor will bear fruit and bring glory to Christ. If I live, I live for Christ. If I die, I die for Christ. <laughs> Simple. That's how he puts it. He makes uh, life so simple in a way. Right? His greatest desire and his greatest hope is one. That Christ would be magnified in him. Doesn't matter whether it's by life or by death. And therefore, he's able to face anything, able to keep his joy no matter what. New Testament believers were advised, were told that if you're suffering as a Christian, if you're suffering for the sake of Christ, don't be ashamed. Peter 1 Peter 4, 16 says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Put your head up high. But let him glorify God in this matter. There's nothing to be ashamed of if you're suffering for the sake of Christ. Now, this does not apply to all suffering just like that. <laughs> Sometimes we suffer because of our own faults. <laughs> And in that case, uh, our suffering doesn't glorify Christ. So in that case, maybe we should be a little ashamed. <laughs> That's different. But here, Paul is suffering for the sake of Christ. And there's nothing for him to be ashamed. And the way he says it is so emphatic. He says, in nothing I will be ashamed. In nothing, in no way whatsoever. Nobody can tell me that, you know, <laughs> suffering more and staying in prison for a few more uh, months or years is shame. No, I, I won't agree, he says. In nothing I will be ashamed. In no way I will be ashamed. Nobody can tell me that if I get my head chopped off, that is a shame, something to be ashamed of. I will not be ashamed. 
whether by life or by death. No matter what happens, it cannot put me to shame because I have my desire and hope clear and above all else in my life, it is that Christ be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. In light of this understanding, the other details in the verse will make more sense. For example, look at verse 20, some of the other details. I give you the main stuff, right? Now, the other details in the verse, the other phrases will make more sense. For example, he says, in nothing I will be ashamed, but with all boldness. What does that mean? Boldness is a Greek word here. That word is used mainly for proclaiming the gospel boldly. Proclaiming the gospel boldly. What Paul is saying is, we can understand it like this. Perhaps you can picture it like this. You know, When I'm questioned, maybe in my trial, my eager expectation and hope is that I won't be ashamed. I won't deny the gospel. I will boldly declare my faith in the gospel of Christ. I will boldly witness for Christ. I will not shrink back in that sense. He says, as always, even now, that means I've always boldly preached the gospel. I've always boldly, you know, witnessed for Christ. And I'll do this even now. Some of the details in uh, verse 19 also make more sense. In verse 19, I told you we left out that uh, the supply of the Holy Spirit, right? Let me say some things about that in verse 19, the supply of the Spirit. So Paul is saying, I know this will turn out for my salvation through your prayer and the help of the Holy Spirit. According to this great desire and hope I have that Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or death. Now let's say some things about the supply of the Holy Spirit. What he probably means is, these bad things will turn out for my good according to this good ending I have in mind. The good ending he has in mind is what? Not that he lives or dies. That is, that's not even a question. The good ending he has in mind is Christ should be magnified in my body. I have a picture of a good ending in my mind. That good ending is my salvation. But that good ending is also where Christ is magnified in my body and for things to turn from how they are in a bad state now and go to this good ending I need your prayer and the help of the Holy Spirit now in what way will the Holy Spirit help probably he means the Holy Spirit will supply that boldness <laughs> the Holy Spirit will supply that boldness in the book of Acts we see this actually happening when the early church is threatened not to preach Christ. For example, when Peter and John went into the temple, remember that miracle they did? And, uh, you know, the whole town was impressed and the leaders of Jerusalem, the religious leaders got upset. They called Peter and John. They said, how dare you do this, you know? Said, okay, fine, you go. Do whatever you want. Don't mention the name of Christ. Don't preach Christ. What do they do? They go and they report this to the other believers in Jerusalem and they gather together and pray. We find this in Acts chapter 4, verse 29. They pray for two things. They pray that God will enable them to continue to speak his word with boldness and that mighty signs and wonders will be performed at the name of Jesus. I don't have time to read this, but you'll see this in Acts 4, 29 and 30. That's what they pray. And in verse 31, we are told that their prayer was answered. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So, people are saying, don't preach Christ. They are praying, saying, God, help us to preach Christ boldly. God answers their prayer, how? By filling them with the Holy Spirit and enabling them to speak the word of God with boldness. They were already filled, actually, in Acts chapter 2 itself. But this was a fresh filling, you may say. This was a timely filling, you may say. A filling for the purpose of speaking God's word boldly. Many, many examples in the book of Acts, very similar to this, of how the Holy Spirit gives them boldness in times of trial, in times of persecution. 
um, in Acts 4, 8, before this, Peter, he was standing before the Sanhedrin. He was filled with the Holy Spirit when he spoke. And that's how he was able to give bold answers. In um, Acts 7, 55, Stephen was about to be stoned. And we are told in Acts 7, 55, he was full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of given a special filling, a special boost. At that moment, Stephen, who's already filled with the Holy Spirit, at the moment they're about to stone him, he gets a special infilling and he gets a special view of Jesus Christ. Interestingly, in our verse, Paul calls the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Maybe to say that the Holy Spirit will point them to Jesus, the Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. Several possible ways of understanding that. Another example of how the Holy Spirit comes in at times of trial to give boldness is found in Acts 13, 52, where Paul and Barnabas were driven from Pisidian Antioch. And then the disciples who were left behind instead of being sad, we're filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Joy is another great theme here in Philippians. So, in what way does the Holy Spirit help? When the believers pray for Paul, he believes that the Holy Spirit will, in a fresh way, fill him, <laughs> supply him with timely help and enable him to be bold in his witness for Christ, give him fresh fillings for boldness, fresh fillings for joy, you may say, right? Paul's great desire and hope, that is his reason. Paul's great desire and hope is so lofty that... Uh, no matter what happens to him, whether he lives or dies, he says, it's not going to take away my joy. That's Paul's fifth reason for joy. So I didn't really apply it to ourself. I didn't want to start there. I wanted you to understand verse 20. Paul's situation is very extreme, anyways, very unique. And so when we apply it to ourselves, we have to be careful. He's suffering for Christ. He's suffering in an extreme way. But there are principles that we can draw from them. What, what is our greatest desire? See, even Paul would have desired to a great deal, to a great extent, I believe, he would have desired to get out of jail. <laughs> but the thing is, even in that situation, he prioritizes his desires. He orders his desires. He says, no, that's not what I want first. What I want first is Christ should be magnified. He has become a mature person to where he has mature and lofty desires. The greatest desire a person can have is that Christ should be glorified in their life or should we say in their earthly existence, <laughs> whether by life or by death. I challenge you, there is no greater desire you can have. I don't have the time to say why that is great today. Maybe later on. Person can have many desires. The greatest desire you can have is that Christ will be magnified in your body. When you have that desire, you can be sure your desire will be fulfilled. You can be more sure of this desire being fulfilled than any other desire being fulfilled. That's how you live a life of joy in all circumstances. The problem is, like, as I said, like children, we have all these other smaller desires which we put to number one. My number one desire is I want this, I want that, you know. <laughs> so that when it looks like we're not going to get what we want, obviously we're disappointed. Of course we're disappointed. But if you can somehow change your heart, which you can't do. 
If you can somehow replace those lesser desires with greater desires, which you can't do. And that's why we have to pray, I think. We have to pray. And that, you know, reminds us about Paul's prayer in Philippians 1.9. He prays that we will grow in love and knowledge. Remember? Discernment. He prays that we will grow in our perception of what is great and what is small. What is lofty and what is not such a big deal. We think small things are big things. And we think big things are small things. If we could somehow see the way Paul sees if we could somehow see the way we are meant to see, we would see that Christ being magnified in our body is far greater than anything else. Perhaps that leads us to verse 21, which we can't cover today. Verse 19, 20, 21 is packed with so much that we have just, you know, scratched the surface, really. But what Paul is saying is, I know this will turn out for my salvation, my ultimate good ending. Why? Because I have the right desire and hope <laughs> to where I can never be disappointed. What is that desire and hope? That Christ would be magnified in my body. Why do I have this? And then he explains that in verse 21. For to me, Living itself is Christ. <laughs> Dying therefore becomes gain. Let's stop here. Let's uh, stand. Let's just spend a minute praying that God would open our eyes to see what is truly great and that is the glory of Christ. The value of Christ. That God would open our eyes to see what is the greatest purpose for our lives. Christ should be magnified in us. Christ's beauty should be seen in and through us. There's nothing greater that, that we can accomplish. The greatest thing we can attain in our earthly existence <laughs> and our eternal existence is for Christ's glory to shine through us. There is nothing greater. And if I had time, I would show you there is nothing that would give you as much joy and fulfillment either. I'll be talking about that next week. When Christ shines in and through us, it's not only the most lofty thing, but it's also the thing that will give us the greatest joy and fulfillment. Let's pray. Let's ask God to tune our hearts in this way to where we desire, because only he can do this. We cannot just go in there and replace one desire with another. We must pray, we must ask him, saying, God, I want to desire your glory, your being magnified in me more than anything else. I want to prioritize my desire in that way. I want my heart to want your glory more than anything else. Lord, we pray that you will do only what you can do, O oh God. Open our eyes. Change our hearts. Change our thinking to where we begin to see the glory of Christ as the greatest thing. The thing that can give us the greatest joy and fulfillment, satisfaction, blessing, honor through all eternity. And may our hearts' desires be ordered after your will. May our mind more and more think your thoughts. For when that happens, we can be sure, we can be certain, absolutely sure and certain, that Christ will be magnified in our body. No matter what happens, it doesn't matter. We can always be joyful. We give you glory. We pray you will continue to lead us, cause us to grow in the Christian life. May we not stagnate. May we not be immature, but may we become more and more mature so that we can be a blessing to others, so that 
the beauty of Jesus Christ can shine in and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.